Hey backers, welcome to the Raiders of the Lost 2 tutorial. In this casual tutorial, I'm going to take you through the basic rules so that you and a friend can play Raiders of the Lost 2, the micro game. Let's get started. The first thing you do when you sit down to play Raiders of the Lost 2 is you need to get your double-sided tiles ready. You need some change, especially a quarter for the boss monster, enough pennies for both players to play, at least six for one player, and at least five for the player who starts with the grail. Now, you also will need at least two nickels to represent the player characters, and you'll also need some spare nickels for the audacity points. I also recommend having a couple of dimes ready so that you can use one to represent the player with the grail, and it's always good to have a couple extra points from your pocket. So, the first thing you do when you start the game is one player is going to flip a coin, and the player who wins the coin uh, wins, and that player is going to be the person who places the first two tile. So, the first thing you do is you take the four tomb tiles that are not the start or the escape, and you shuffle them up. Mix them up, okay. Then you take the start, you place that on top, and you place the escape one on the bottom. The person who won that coin toss is going to be the person who gets the place to start. Basically, they get to choose which side they want a place to start tile on, and place it somewhere here on the board. The next player, the player who lost the coin toss, will get a chance to play the next tile. In order to place subsequent tiles after the start, a player must take them and attach them to the end part of the start tile facing outward. So basically, you will take and choose which side of the double-sided tile you want to play on, and then that player will take one of the room spaces and overlap the tile before it on the end of the tile. So, you have a choice of basically placing it whichever way you want on the last two room spaces of that room tile. The reason why this is important is because it comes into the strategy a lot which way you may want to walk depending on the probability of the numbers in the game. So, I'm just going to quickly set this board up and take you through a couple turns of the game so you can get a feel for how the game flows. So that is a basic setup of how Raiders of the Lost Tomb will begin. So the player who lost the opening coin toss is the player who is the Grail player. They're the one who first laid their hands on the Holy Grail at the beginning of the game. And they start the game on the start tile with the little dime that represents the Holy Grail. The other player is going to start their character on Tails, and they will start right outside of the start player. You also have to remember to place the quarter on the number eight on the boss monster track, so you can keep track of when he's going to come out. Every round, after both players have gone, you move the boss monster track down by one. Once it reaches one, it will eventually then move to the start space and begin to chase down the players. So you really want to be careful and try to move through the tomb as quickly as you can. So the player who has the grail here is going to take five pennies. They start the game with five pennies and they start the game with three audacity points. The grail player gets an extra audacity, but they start the game with one less penny. The other player, the player without the grail, begins the game with six pennies instead of five. And they begin the game with two audacity points as they uh, also start second in the game. So I'm gonna take you through a couple of movements. I'm gonna roll the pennies and I'm going to move around the tomb and just kind of show you how it'll flow. So anyway, first player here, the uh, Holy Grail player is gonna roll the pennies. I'll rattle them around, roll them here, and let's count them up. So we have one, two, three heads and two tails. So we have a three, a two, and a four. Uh, you may move. Um, orthogonally meaning backwards and forwards and you can also move in this game diagonally so just to represent that I and illustrate that I'm going to move to the number two using the pennies on the tail side for my number 
So I moved the number two. Now it's the other player's turn. So they're going to get to roll their six pennies. And let's see what they got. They got uh, uh, four heads and two tails. So they can either move here to the four or they can move to the two. So to illustrate what happens when you land on another player, which is one of the most important parts about the game where the conflict and the excitement comes in, I'm going to move directly to the two. You might not want to do this at the beginning of the game because uh, there are certain strategies or certain choices you may want to use to plan out the game. But uh, to illustrate combat right away, I'm going to move the other player who does not have the Grail directly on top of the Grail player using that two. So immediately when the player without the Grail lands on the space with the player with the Grail, they immediately will roll combat. In order to do combat, the both players roll their pennies and the player with the most heads wins the combat. Ties go to the defending player with the Grail. So I'm just going to do a quick roll just to illustrate how it'll work out. So here is the player who did not have the Grail. They ended up with two heads. Remember, all the tails do not count. And then the player with the Grail roll their five pennies. Oh, okay, so the player with the Grail ended up rolling three heads. So they immediately would win the combat. However, audacity may still be spent. But keep in mind that the Grail player begins the game with three audacity and the player without the Grail only starts with two. So the player with the Grail can always win a first combat as long as they get equal to or greater than the amount of heads than the, def uh, than the offensive player. So at this point, strategically, I would not use any audacity for the, uh, for the attacker uh, because uh, you know, it would just be a waste at this point. So the next turn goes. So basically, if the attacking player uh, loses the combat, um, their turn is over, nothing bad happens, uh, except that they let the person with the Grail get away. So it's now the Grail person's turn. So I'm just manipulating where they are, and the Grail person's turn is going to start, so I'm gonna roll their five pennies, and we're gonna move them. So, okay, so we have uh, four tails and one head, so that means I can move to a four or a one. There's a four right there, so I'm going to have the Grail player move to the space with the four. All right, so now it's immediately the next third person's player. So I'm going to roll the, the player who does not have the Grail, the Raider with new Grail. We're going to roll their pennies and boom. So we got three heads and three tails. So the player with the Grail had a four, so I won't be able to follow them directly unless I decide to use an Audacity. So the player who uh, does not have the Grail is going to decide to use an Audacity point, so they discard an Audacity, and then they automatically will alter one of the numbers, either the heads or the tail number, to equal the number of the space that they want to move on. So basically, once you discard an Audacity, you can make a 3 into a 4 or into a 2. It doesn't change the actual pennies that were rolled, but it changes the effective number for movement or for combat or for whatever you might be rolling against. So he changes his movement score into a four, moves into the same space with the player with the grail, and then once again, combat begins immediately. So I'm gonna do one more quick combat to make sure that uh, you guys completely understand combat here. So we're gonna roll the six pennies for the attacker. This time he got three heads. And we'll roll the one for the defender with the grail, the five pennies, and he only has two this time. So right off the bat, the attacking player who does not have the grail beat the player who does have the grail. Uh, however, the grail player has the opportunity to use their audacity first to change their head's roll up to try to either equal or beat the grail player's, uh, the non-grail player's roll. So uh, the Grail player doesn't want to lose the Grail right away, so they're going to uh, spend one Audacity, uh, knowing that the other player only has one left, to up their roll to a three to equal that player's roll, which means the other player now has an opportunity, do they want to spend that last final Audacity that they have currently, or do they want to just let the Grail player go again, but now they had to waste an Audacity to do it. So 
that's what the decisions are that you're gonna have to make during that the part of this part of this game so we're going to use that actual audacity we're gonna up the three heads of the attacker to four meaning that now the attacker has gone one up on the defender beats them okay but has no audacity left now they spent both they beat that player they get the grail okay they immediately steal the grail from the person who has the grail and then the player with the grail has to spend their next turn resting to regain that penny that they lost there are two actions that a raider can take that have nothing to do with movement the first action is called the rest action you can choose to not move and you can regain a penny that you've lost you cannot regain a penny above your starting amount of pennies ever in the game you may gain pennies that are higher if you succeed in encounter rooms but you cannot regain a penny from resting higher than your starting penny amount so if you have the grail it's five if you don't have the grail it's six the other action that you can take uh, that is not movement or, or attacking another player by moving on them is you can prepare if you want to prepare you prepare by again not moving and in when you prepare you actually get to take an audacity um, for not moving that turn um, taking an audacity can be really helpful and you can literally use that as a strategy when you're waiting to try to figure out a very difficult location when there's multiple encounters in one place or if it's a really high number that you know you might need some help on so sometimes preparing can be really important there's also a really cool bonus in the game whenever you roll a natural six meaning you roll the pennies and you ended up with either six heads or six tails you can't use audacity for this one you immediately can move to any adjacent space to you any space you want to move to and you also get one free bonus audacity. This could be a really great bonus, but it's very rare to roll. Okay, now we want to explain encounter rooms. There are three different types of encounter rooms in Raiders of the Lost Tomb. The trap room, the portal room, and also the monster room. Each one can do different things, but only two of them will suck you in and do really nasty things to you when you're adjacent to them. The first one is the trap room. So let me illustrate what happens. Basically, right here, my character's still here with the grail. <clears throat> and let's say that I need to move here to this floor because I don't want to uh, move onto the trap room if I don't have to. However, you may freely move onto it if you so desire, but let's show you why you might not want to do that. So I roll and I needed to get a four, but I got three tails and two heads. So uh, I didn't get a four, so I am going to immediately get sucked into the trap room. I have no audacity to, to change my, my three to a four, so I, I got sucked into the trap room. So you immediately move your character into the trap room. Now, on my next turn, I need to move out of the trap room. So in order to do that, I would need to roll a five or a six on the pennies, either heads or tails, a five or six to move out. If I fail to do that in a trap room, the penalty is you lose a penny permanently from your supply. So if you're the Grail player, for instance, you'd go down to four. If you're the other player, you'd go down to five from six. Uh, but then you move ahead to whatever space you want that's adjacent to the trap room. So it's like you're running through a room with lots of darts and you get shot with a dart and you got poisoned. So you got slowed down a little bit by the trap. Okay. Now, if uh, you just so happen to be in a monster room, uh, and you fail your roll, uh, the monster room, and if you don't get a five or a six, the monster room will kick you backwards to where you came from and also force you to lose an audacity. So trap room makes you lose a penny and the monster room kicks you back one space and makes you lose an audacity if you fail your five or six roll in there. Now, on the trap and the monster rooms, those are the two ones that will suck you in if you don't make your roll when you're adjacent to them those two rooms um, you can only be pulled in and sucked into them if you fail your roll when you are behind that room further away from the escape so in order to illustrate how that works i'm just going to kind of show you a couple scenarios with where your character would be and where you'd be sucked in if you failed your roll so basically for instance on this trap room here in the middle if I was on this one space and I failed my roll to get to the two, I would be sucked in diagonally. 
If I was on the two space and I failed my roll, I would also be sucked in that, uh, sideways here. However, if I was on the three space, I would not get pulled in or sucked into the trap room because I am ahead of where the trap is compared to the escape. Now, if you succeed your roll of a five or six, you actually get something good. So, uh, if you succeed your roll of a five or a six on the trap room, you will actually gain a penny, a penny from the outside into your stack of pennies. So if you had five, you'd then have six. Um, or if you had uh, six, you'd have seven. So you'd actually gain a whole penny for succeeding in the trap room. And then you can also move to any space that's adjacent to the room. You move out, okay? If you succeed on a monster room, you actually then gain an audacity and get to move to any space that you want. So the basic way to remember trap rooms and monster rooms is you lose and you gain the same thing. And basically you either move ahead if it's a trap room or you move backwards if it's a monster room. Every time you fail your roll and you're adjacent to a monster or a trap room, you'll get pulled in as long as you're not ahead of it closer to the escape. You can be pulled in multiple times, which can be rather devastating if you don't roll the proper numbers and you get to the proper spaces that you need to be. The only other room that we haven't mentioned yet, encounter room wise, is the portal room. Portal is a really cool room because it can help you skip a bunch of spaces with one room. Because basically a portal will transport you in one move from portal to portal. Sometimes, depending on how you place the tiles, the portal could be all the way over here, be ultra beneficial, or in this instance, it's very close. But it still saves you at least two moves, potentially. Now, when you're next to a portal room, uh, and you fail your roll, you won't necessarily be pulled in. However, you can move in uh, on your own if you decide you want to move into the portal room. And when you go in there, basically on your next turn, you must roll a five or a six to transport to the other portal. If you fail your roll, you automatically get pushed back to the previous tile. So basically, if you're here on the portal, you end up going back two spaces and you get to choose whether or not you want to be on this one or that one. But basically you get thrown back a couple of spaces. If I was on this one, I'd get thrown all the way back to this, this particular zone, either there, there, or there, wherever I chose that was adjacent to the top. But you get thrown back one full tile space if you fail. But if you succeed, you move to the other portal, which can be really, really big in the game. Remember, the portal room can only be attempted one time. So if you ever, move into the portal room on purpose, you can only try to use it once. Now, now that we've gone over encounter rooms, I wanna show you how the boss monster works. So after eight rounds of play, let's just say the characters got somewhere over here, right? So the two characters got over here. Um, all right, so basically, let's say the boss monster made it over here to the start. Now, when a player rolls to move, now that every round he finally came out, a player rolls to move, so let's just say the grail player is going to roll. I roll the five pennies, I count them up. So now I got three pen, uh, three tails and uh, two heads. So I can move the three um, and uh, that three if I want. Okay, so basically my only move is to go into the three. So what's going to happen is, is I'm going to choose to move to the three. And, and now the boss monster gets to move to the opposite number that I didn't use. So I used the three, the boss monster moves to a two. So as you can see, I moved to the three, the two's here, boss monster's adjacent to the two, boom. The boss monster moves to the two. Boss monster will never move backwards in movement. So another big part of the strategy of this game is to figure out which of the roles you wanna use because sometimes you'll have multiple options and you might be able to delay the boss monster by choosing to move to a different space. Well, let's go over how the boss monster can uh, attack the players. When the boss monster lands on top of a player, the boss monster will basically trap that player. So the player has to roll a five or six, just like if he was in the trap or the monster room, to escape the boss monster. So basically, let's just illustrate what happens. So if I roll here and I'm the player without the grail, uh, I would have rolled six, so roll that extra penny. So I got uh, three heads and three tails. I have no audacity, let's just say. So I failed my roll against the boss monster. He immediately is going to kick me backwards 
one space, either this way or that way. He's gonna make me lose a whole penny. And if I had an audacity, I would lose an audacity as well. So it's really nasty to get beat by the boss monster because he brings you down a lot. If at any time a player loses all their pennies because of trap rooms, the boss monster attacks, or something to that effect, that player is killed and is out of the game. If that player had the grail, they drop it in the room where they, they died, and the other player has to go there and retrieve it. If a player lands on the space with the grail, they automatically pick it up, they would lose a penny and gain an audacity, and they still have to leave the tomb and escape before the boss monster can close that door. Now, if I had beaten the boss monster, what would happen is, is I would gain a penny, I would gain an audacity, and I would get to move forward any space away from the boss monster. Now, that only leaves me one space ahead of the boss monster, so he can still come catch, catch up to me, but I might have a little bit of an edge because now I have the extra penny and I have the audacity. So, <clears throat> when the boss monster moves on to the, play, uh, the one with the play with the grail on it, um, it doesn't affect anything with the grail if the boss monster defeats the player with the grail. It, again, just kicks it backwards and uh, he would lose the penny and the audacity. So now you know the basics of how the boss monster moves. Now the boss monster also gets one extra special bonus when he moves. If he ever moves adjacent to an encounter room, the boss monster moves automatically on it. It's kind of like one of those boosters in a racing video game, where basically the boss monster, if he's ever adjacent to one of these rooms, he moves on it, so it moves in an extra space. So again, if he's like right here on the four, if he ends his move there, he will move to that portal room and his next turn will be started from that portal room. Now, the boss monster doesn't get affected by the portal, the trap, or the monster room, but it does give him a bonus movement. Whenever you choose a rest or prepare action, you have to remember that if the monster, the boss monster, has entered the tomb, you have to remember after you have not rolled to move, you still need to roll for the monster to move. So you roll the pennies, and basically what happens is the monster has a minor advantage if you wait because the monster then gets to choose from either one of the faces that you've rolled. Now that we've gone over the basic principles of how to play the game and how the encounter rooms work, let's just go over how to win the game and how to lose. So to win the game, in order to win, the object of the game is for the player who has the grail to get to the escape before the player can either be robbed by the other player and they get to the escape first, or the boss monster gets to the escape space and seals the tomb forever. If the player with the grail is adjacent to the escape space like that, for instance, they're on the four, they need to roll on their next turn the same number that they're on. So for instance, right here, if I roll the four and I move to that four to escape, I'd have to roll another four. And as soon as the player gets to the escape and they have the grail, they automatically win the game. You cannot win the game if you don't have the grail. So the player without the grail, if, they, if they're if they still in the tomb when the player with the grail leaves, they uh, lose the game. The player without the grail can never leave the tomb um, without the grail. The last thing is, is that Raiders of the Lost Tomb actually has some interesting variants to the game. We have added some advanced tiles and some advanced rules and optional setups that are in the rule book that you can try out once you've played the basic game multiple times for a harder difficulty and a harder challenge. For instance, as you can see, we have some yellow rooms with a red outline. Those mean if you turn the advanced rules on for that, basically you have to roll that number in heads. You could still use audacity for it, but you have to use the heads number only on your roll to move to that spot. There's also optional variants for audacity to change how that works in the game. And there's also different optional setups for how you can set up the tomb. For instance, if you want a shorter game, you can actually make it so that the tiles only have, they connect by two, for instance. So that'll shorten the length of the game. If you want a longer game, for instance, you can make them so they don't even connect, which will actually lengthen the tomb quite a bit. Thank you very much for watching the Raiders of the Lost Tomb tutorial. We hope you really enjoyed the game. I highly recommend that you download the free print and play on Board Game Geek, try the game, and if you like it, please back us on Kickstarter in this pay-what-you-want campaign. Thank you so much.
Thanks for watching.